Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity now to open up the scripture and to read your word and to learn from your word. And I pray for the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Lord, we thank you for your word and the opportunity that we have to not only read it, but to hear it. Lord, teach us from your word today what it looks like to follow Jesus, to glorify you, to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that even now you would bless the preaching of your word for your glory. I pray for every mind to be attentive, for every ear to listen, and for every heart to be receptive. I ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to go ahead and invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, this will be our final sermon in the series I started in December, entitled Jesus, Jesus. And uh, we've been in the gospel of Luke really this whole time, and so we're going to be there once again today. So Luke chapter 2 is where we will be today. Now, if you look at your bulletin, it says that I'll be starting the book of Romans, January the 2nd. Actually, I'm going to start the book of Romans the second Sunday in January, not the first Sunday. Uh, the first Sunday in January, i got a treat for you. Ashton, our youth pastor, will preach the first service, and then my son, Seth, will preach the second service. And I'll be here, so it'll be a, it'll be a great day to watch those uh, two young men uh, who I've been mentoring now for some time, one longer than the other, of course, <laughs> And uh, to be able to, to sit under the preaching of God's Word. Look there with me at Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. The Scripture says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning... The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, about 25 miles. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house about the father's business, right? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. I've never been to Berlin. Some of you may have. But from what I understand, there are hundreds of things to see in Berlin. However, few tourists actually pay attention to what's under their feet. In Berlin, on certain parts of the street near the capital, you'll find a four-inch by four-inch block of brass embedded in the pavement. Now, once you notice them, they're easy to see. But very few people take time to stop and look and know that they exist. But once you realize them, you begin to see them with quite frequency. Each stone of brass is engraved with the name and fate of an individual who suffered under the Nazi regime. I think we have a picture of what I'm talking about on the screen. It's to commemorate their lives of those who suffered during the Holocaust. These small brass stones are known as Stoplersteins or 
stumbling stones. There are over 8,000 of them in the German capital and tens of thousands of them spread across European countries making it the largest decentralized monument in the world. The idea was conceived by a German artist named Gunter Deming in 1992, of course, to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust. Each block begins with here lived each block. It's placed at the exact spot where the person lived before they fell victim to the Nazi terror and were exterminated in the concentration camps. Unlike other Holocaust memorials, the focus, which only focuses on the Jew, these stones also focus on Not only the Jews who suffered, but the disabled who suffered and the descendant who suffered. Now what makes this monument so, I, I think, so special is the fact that in order for you to read the stone, you actually have to bow down before the victim. Think about that. To read the stone, you actually have to bow down before the victim. I don't know if there's anything or if there's a better picture of submission than a person bowing down before God. One of the problems that I have, it's not really a problem, but this is an example of what I'm about to say, usually I like to have my sermon titles turned in by Tuesday or Wednesday so we can put them out on the street sign so people know what I'm going to be preaching the coming Sunday. However, as I studied this passage throughout the week, I wanted to desperately change the title. Of course, we are going to look at Jesus' first words But I would have changed this sermon title to A Submissive Inner Spirit. A Submissive Inner Spirit. What does it look like to be submissive before God? What does it look like to actually bow down before God and give Him the honor in which He deserves? Now, when I first started looking at this passage, of course, I was focusing on verses 41 through 52. And my plan was to preach a sermon today on the first words of Jesus, which were, Why are you searching for me? Don't you know that I must be about my Father's business? In, 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 in the Gospel of Luke, we have a transition taking place in these verses, we, we are moving from Jesus' infancy into his adult ministry. So chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, Luke supplies as a transition. But as I begin to study this verse, I begin to back away and look at what's called the literary context. In other words, what's going on in the chapters before? What's going on in the chapters after? What is the literary context of this passage of Scripture? And when I begin to back away and look at the bigger picture, God began to show me something that will serve today as the main emphasis of this, of this message. So, of course, when you look at chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, it's quite obvious that not only do we see the humanity of Christ, a 12-year-old boy, we also see the deity of Christ with his wisdom, and, uh, which, which just confounded the wise. Uh, we also see something about Jesus. We see the submissiveness of Christ. He goes to the temple. In submission to God. 
He says, I must be about my father's business. So when we look at, the, when we look at Christ here, even as a young man or as a boy, what do we notice about Christ? We notice that Christ himself has a submissive inner spirit. But let's back up. And I want you to turn with me now to Luke chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 22. In the preceding verses, listen, we have a word here for older men. We also have a word here for older women. As we progress through the passage, we are going to notice that there's also a word here for married couples. There's a word here for young people. And there's a word here for all of us. So the first word that we see here is a word for older men. Verse 22, And when they came from their purifications according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem. Notice what his parents are doing. They brought him and they presented him to the Lord at the temple. So we see Joseph and Mary being obedient to the law. Verse 23, As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens The womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms, Simeon did, and he blessed God and said, Lord, you are now letting your servant depart in peace. According to your words, my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said by him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for for the fall and the rising of many in Israel for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many's hearts may be revealed. What do we see with Simeon? We see an older man. The scripture defines him as being righteous and devout. A man who had the Holy Spirit upon him, which was uncommon at that time. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon this man. And what was he doing? He was waiting To see the Lord's Christ. He was waiting to see his Messiah. And then notice what happens. When he sees Christ the Lord, he is ready to die. He is ready to go on to heaven. Why? Because his prayers have been answered. Do you notice what we see about Simeon in this passage? We see a submissive inner spirit toward God. A submissive inner spirit toward God. I told you this is a word for older men. Simeon represents the older men. I pray that the older men in this congregation and those who hear this message, I pray that you would cultivate within yourself. And it can only be done by the Spirit of God. A submissive inner spirit toward God. But not only do we see this with Simeon, we also see this with an older woman by the name of Anna. Look there at verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher, who was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years. So she only was married seven years, from whom she was a virgin. 
but she was a widow, according to verse 37, for 84 years. Now notice what the Bible says about her. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak to Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Notice you see the same thing in Anna that we saw in Simeon. We see this submissive inner spirit toward the Lord. Now why am I emphasizing, or why is the text emphasizing these truths, I believe? Because people love their autonomy. People love their own self-interest. They, we, I mean, if we're honest, we want to do what we want to do. And if we're honest, we only want to give the Lord so much. There's certain things that we want to hold back for ourselves. It's a constant battle. But what we see this morning in this passage of Scripture is how the Lord values a submissive inner spirit within His people. Now, that's the literary context. But now we move into the immediate context of our verse for today. And not only do we have a word for older men and older women, we have a word here for married couples. You see, we, we saw it at the beginning of verse 22. Again, I'm not going to read it again, but this is when Joseph and Mary took Jesus to be dedicated at the temple. But notice, that we, notice where we find Joseph and Mary again. Jesus is no longer an infant like he was in verse 22. Now, he is a 12-year-old boy in verse 41. But notice Mary and Joseph. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. They're together. They were together in verse 22 and following, and here they are together in the temple, worshiping God once again. They went according to the custom, and when the feast was over, it was ended as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But what do I want you to notice here? I want you to notice the submissive inner spirit of Joseph and Mary. They went to Jerusalem, the Bible says, every year to celebrate the Feast of Passover. This isn't the first time we saw them in the temple. We saw them back in verse 22 in the temple dedicating Christ when he was an infant. Here we see Joseph and Mary worshiping together, honoring God together, raising their child together to know God. So as we look at this passage of Scripture, we learn something, not just about older men or older women. We also learn that the Lord desires the same attribute in the lives of married couples. And what is that? A submissive inner spirit toward the Lord. Now, of course, Christ is the main character of this narrative. And Christ displays it better than anyone. We look at Christ in this passage of Scripture, and the Bible says, and we don't know all that's going along here, but Jesus had a fervor to obey God. He knew His purpose, He knew His mission, He had one single focus, and Christ Himself, who is God in the flesh, has a submissive inner spirit toward the Father. Jesus stays behind, and the Scripture says that He went into the temple. His parents come searching for Him. In verse 45, and when they did not find Him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for Him. After three days, look here, verse 46, after three days they found Him in the temple, sitting among the teachers. Now this is an important word. Notice what He's doing. He is sitting among the teachers 
listening. The very one who spoke the world into existence and who has given us this word, the all-wise, all-knowing God, sat and listened. And not only did he sit and listen, what did he do? He asked questions. And the Bible says all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And of course his his parents find him and they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in a great distance. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? In other words, he must be about his father's business. So we look at Christ and we see this submissive inner spirit. We see it even before the birth of Christ. As Christ himself is eternal God. Who left the glories of heaven. And and we see the submissive inner spirit of Christ at the incarnation. And now we see the submissive inner spirit of Christ here at the temple sitting and listening and asking questions and being obedient to the Father who is in heaven. But then we have this remarkable statement. Right after he said to them, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house about the Father's business? The Bible says that they didn't understand what he spoke to them. But then this remarkable passage, or verse, verse 51. And he went down with them and he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to see in Christ that his whole life and ministry is characterized characterized by this Submissive inner spirit. So as I told you before, not only do we have a word here for old men. What is it? That you would live your life with a submissive inner spirit toward God. And for older women, that you too would live your life with a submissive inner spirit toward God. For married couples, just like Joseph and Mary, that that together... You and your spouse would have a submissive inner spirit toward God and teach your children to do the same. But we also have a word here for young people. Jesus at the age of 12. When his parents could not find him, they looked and they searched. And when they did find him, what was he doing? Was he causing trouble? No, he was in his father's house about his father's business. Listen to me, young people. Christ himself is modeling for us all what God values. And what God values in us is that we walk toward God with a submissive inner spirit toward the Lord. It's lost today. It's something that needs to be restored within us. It's something that we must seek, which brings us to that reality that really there's a word for this in all of us, isn't it? For all of us. And what's the word for all of us? That we are to have a submissive inner, uh, inner spirit toward God. Now let me share with you some practical application. When you take that statement, a submissive inner spirit, you can sum that up with one word. Meekness. Gentleness. Do you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. 
I don't know if you've noticed, but about the past three Sundays, I've brought up that word meek. I didn't do it intentionally. The Spirit of the Lord put it on my lips. And now I realize why. Because it's something personally that God is dealing with your pastor about. I mentioned it the last three Sundays. I've thought about it in my mind as I've driven down the road. And then two days ago, I was at the hospital, and I was talking with a man who had a t-shirt on that said meekness. And then as I begin to study this text with all intentions to come in here and just to spend my time on those words, I'm about my father's business, the Lord began to show me something else that was happening in this passage. I will say to you in all honesty that the Lord is working this in your pastor, this meekness. This submissive inner spirit toward God. Listen, in all things, not some things, but in all things. So how do, am I, should I just wait on God to zap me somehow? God doesn't zap, by the way. Should I just wait on God to should I just sit back and just wait on God to, to cultivate this meekness within me? Or do I have a responsibility? Well, the scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, but knowing it's God who is at work in you. So we have a responsibility, but ultimately it's the Lord who works this submissive inner spirit up within us. It's God who blesses us with meekness. It's a fruit of the spirit, gentleness. Synonymous terms. So if you desire, as I do, to have this submissive inner spirit cultivated within you, then first, we must have a repentant spirit. We must have a re repentant spirit. We must lay aside wickedness. In other words, we must repent. We must be willing to repent. Many of us who have been saved still have an unsanctified part of our lives where residual st sin still lingers. And you know what it is. Because God's already been dealing with you about it. You know what that residual sin is in your life. You know exactly what it is. And if you don't, ask God to show you. But, I, but if you're anything like me, you know what it is. And it's that wickedness that we truly haven't laid aside. And the Lord is saying to us all, my desire is to cultivate within you a submissive inner spirit unto the Lord. But you've got to be willing to repent. Secondly, not only do we need to have a repentant spirit, we need to have a receptive spirit. And when I'm talking about receptive spirit, I'm talking about how it pertains to the Word of God. How do you approach God's Word? Do you approach God's Word by saying, let me go in there and see what I can dig out and find? Now there's a time for that, especially when you're preparing a lesson or a sermon. Is that how you approach the Word though? Let me... Come to the Word and, and let me dig in it and let me see what I can find. That's not what I'm talking about. To have a receptive spirit means you come to the Word and you say, Thank you, God. 
thank you for your word. Your word is a gift to me. And I welcome your word into my life. I delight in your word. You read it. And you delight in it. And you welcome it. Whatever it says, you welcome it into your life. And then we must have a responsive spirit. It was James who said, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Yes, we are to repent. Yes, we are to receive the word. We are to welcome the word. The word is to be implanted into our hearts. But then we have a responsibility to be doers of the word. What you believe is actually how you live. Look at your life right now and it will tell you whether or not you've been repentant and receptive and responsive. If, If we claim to be Christ followers, but yet we are not receptive and repentant and responsive to the word of God, then... It's nothing more than religious talk. We are to be doers of the word. If you come to church and you don't practice what you hear, or if you read your morning devotion and say, I got a nugget today from the word, but you don't live by it, then you are guilty of one grand self self deception it was James who said that if we are not doers of the word then we are what double minded man unstable in his ways Jesus said but everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a and does not do them I'm sorry will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand But we are to be those who hear the word and obey the word so that we can be like those who built their house upon the rock. So what what I see in this passage of scripture is what pleases God. And what pleases God is that we walk with a submissive inner spirit toward him in all things. And not only does this please God, it was modeled by God himself. Not just at the incarnation, not just here with Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the temple, but it was demonstrated at the cross. When Christ said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It was was demonstrated on the cross when Christ said, it is finished. finished. This is what the Lord desires from us. A submissive inner spirit. Meekness. And meekness is not weakness. It's actually strength under control. I want you to notice something. I kind of saved it for now, but let me show it to you. We have one of those bracketed statements here. Those bookends, known as an inclusio, right? Watch this. Look at verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. Look at verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Look at how that passage ends. Look at verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. Those bracketed statements. Christ grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and in the favor of, in the favor of God was upon him. And then in verse 
52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and the favor of God and man was upon him. I don't know about you, but that's what I want for my life. I I want my life to be characterized by strength and wisdom and the favor of God. Well, what's Luke telling us? You want that? God wants it for you too. But the key to your spiritual growth is that you have a submissive inner spirit toward God in everything. I started off by saying that one of the great things about the monument that we looked at earlier was that in order to read it, you had to bow before the victim. It's powerful. In order for us to grow in strength and wisdom and in favor with God and man, we must bow before the Lord with a submissive inner spirit. Where does that begin? It begins with first coming to the Lord In salvation, acknowledging your sin and being willing to repent of your sin and turn away from living life for yourself and and to turn to Christ and be saved. To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. To know that in your heart and mind, that if you were to die today, your sins are forgiven and you'd be ushered into the presence of Jesus. During this time of invitation, you're going to have an opportunity. You're going to have an opportunity to come and to pray with one of our pastors. I'll be down front and let us pray with you about your salvation. Others of you, God had you here today because he wants to do the same thing in your life that he's doing in my life which is cultivate that submissive inner spirit that takes repentance and receptivity and responding to God in obedience. What specific area of your life are you holding back from giving to God? Because that's what he's asking you to give him today. What's the byproduct of this submissive inner spirit? Strength, wisdom, favor with God. So the altar will be open for you to come this morning and and just to submit yourself before the Lord even now if he so leads you. especially those of you who need salvation. Others of you may have a call on your life and you haven't made that publicly yet and you need to do that. Others of you, God's been dealing with you about joining this church and this is an opportunity for you to to demonstrate that submissive inner spirit by, by coming forward and being a part of this fellowship. Whatever it is that God's doing in your life right now, let Him do it. Let him have his own way. Father God, I commit this time to you now. And I pray that we would respond to you with submissive inner spirits, Lord. Meekness. And I ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and come now as the Lord leads? You come.